Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. They were written to convert people to Christ and to edify the saints and give permanent records of those things in the life of Christ that convince us that he is the only begotten Son of God. Uh, Mark, in fact, omits large portions of the Lord's life and even his final hours on earth. He states the facts in a very forthright, very simple manner. He doesn't give a lot of comment. Um, he doesn't do anything like that. He just says, here it is. As I said, he writes as if he's almost observing it as it happens. He does depict Jesus as the perfect God and the perfect man. And he addresses Christ's humanity as well as his deity. Again, keep in mind to whom he wrote this book. These were a people who magnified power who magnified getting things done decently in an order and uh, knowing how to administrate a whole empire. They knew how to do that as well as any people that have been on this earth up to this present time. Uh, the British did a great job of their empire when it was said that the sun never set on the British empire, but they didn't do any better job than did the Romans. And they had a whole lot more to do with, especially from the 19th century onward. But he's, he knows to whom he's writing. He knows their mindset. He understands their culture. And that's very important. If you were going today to even work up in the New England states, but especially if you left the United States, and you went uh, to some place, let's just say closest to us, uh, to like us, if you went to uh, the United Kingdom, you say, well, they're a lot like us. Well, they may be more now because the world is getting smaller through information and all that kind of thing. But I'm telling you right now, they're European. Now, they're going to separate themselves and their mindset from continental Europe. But nevertheless, uh, they're not going to be like us, and we're not going to be like them. Does that mean we're totally separated and everything? No, it doesn't. Does that not mean that we uh, have a lot more things alike than maybe we would with French or Germans or Russians? Uh, certainly it does. But nevertheless, if you went over there, you would find that there's a great deal of difference in us. If you want to communicate the gospel to them, if you want to convert them, you have to study about their history. You have to study about their culture. You have to know about certain things. And that would be true if you were going to Malaysia or whatever else. It would be true if you were trying to study with someone who uh, is a Muslim in the United States. You'd need to know something about Islam and their background and how they view things through all of that. Um, so he did. And the book bears the marks of dealing primarily with the Roman thinking world. It's interesting that Mark's favorite title for Jesus is the Son of Man, which of course stresses his humanity. And I don't know that we emphasize that maybe as much as we ought to. It seems to me we emphasize he's the Son of God. Maybe that's because we want to convince people that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is deity. But son of to the Jew and to many others meant that you were on an equality with that person. That's why that Jews had a conniption fit uh, when Jesus admitted he was the son of God. That was blasphemy because it put him on equal with God. Mark emphasizes uh, the independence um, courage and power that Jesus showed in his work among men. Again, something that particularly appealed to the Roman mind. He shows Jesus' concern for human need. 
that's something that a lot of people in those that day and age, and I think grows more and more in our age, that people didn't have. And that is not too much interested in anybody else's need. So we're pretty much interested in what we want. And uh, that's about it. Nothing else should get in our way, even other people and their needs, especially when they can't supply those needs for themselves. Think about how much Jesus talked to the Jews about that. He does present Jesus as the servant of, of God. And his record is one that would appeal to the Romans because 16 chapters and it moves rather quickly. Um, that's a very important point to keep in mind when it comes to just little observations. Uh, W.S. Deal, D-E-A-L, in a work said that and I'm quoting, he packs into the short limits, and I'm using his terms, of his gospel more of the deeds of our Lord and far less of his discourses. I don't know whether any of you ever have read um, Caesar's Gallic commentaries, but if you do, you'll read about what all Caesar did and how well he did it and how he was responsible for it, and it wouldn't have gotten done without him. And when there was a crisis, the battle, he was the one that stepped forward and solved the whole situation. That was the Roman mind. That's the reason that empire was like it was. And uh, that even comments on the fact that Pilate went ahead and crucified Jesus when he said, I can't find any fault in him. Because it would get rid of a problem. And uh, since he was accused by the Jews of fomenting strife, uh, of being rebellious to the Roman Empire, he said he was a king. They said, we don't have any king but Caesar. Then the simplest way in the mind of those people who did not see the world as we do and did not think of afterlife as we do, didn't view anything like we do, just get rid of them. Stalin, of course, any communist is an atheist, but Stalin uh, said, if man's a problem, get rid of the man, get rid of the problem. That gets right to the point. And he didn't mind doing that, neither did the Romans. That didn't mean they wouldn't if they thought it was better to keep a fellow alive. And what they started doing was just what they did to John. If he was a very influential person, but they considered him to be a danger, then they would exile him. And where was John when he wrote the book of Revelation? He was exiled on Patmos. But they liked deeds. And they like them done very well. And John stresses also facts rather than topics or themes. And that was also important in the Roman mind. If you read any of their works, any of their historians, then you'll find that they don't embellish things too much. They just state what they understood the fact to be, and that's the way it worked. Um, Another fellow by the name of H.C. Uh, Thiessen said that Mark is a gospel of deeds. I think that's interesting when you realize the book of James is a practical book, gets right down to what you do every day to be faithful to God. And yet uh, he makes it clear that faith without work is dead. So deeds play an important part in our proving our faithfulness or that we're not. Um, so you'll see that Mark is um, concerned with the activity of Jesus while he was on the earth. And uh, he was, of course, while he was on the earth, announcing his coming kingdom. Again, he wrote for Gentiles, more specifically Romans. And notice this when you read those 16 chapters. He rarely quotes the Old Testament. He scarcely mentions fulfilled prophecy. And those two things alone is, is, is so different from Matthew, who wrote for the Jews, and they were thoroughly anchored in the Old Testament. Uh, you'll notice that he omits, that is, Mark does, the genealogy of Jewish ancestry. The Romans and the Gentiles didn't care much about that. Um, Paul even warned about those who... Uh, tried to say we're closer to God than anybody else when they got into discussions of genealogy. 
when you see the Judy Isaac teacher and the way he acted, and you see how they try to discredit Paul as an apostle, and Paul says, well, you make me because of your carnality. I have to show you what I have suffered because of Christ, and uh, you'll see that my pedigree is far greater than those who try to discredit me. And uh, in other words, Paul is saying, if you want to get on that level, you still can't beat me there. It's a book um, uh, characterized by realism. Facing reality sometimes is not an easy thing. And a whole host of folks have a hard time facing reality. Facing reality is facing the facts. It's not wishful thinking. It's not saying, I wish I had done this, or I wish this had been that way, and then lamenting the fact that it's not. It just simply deals with the way things are. Uh, truth corresponds with reality. It's a matter of, of truth that some of us are not young anymore, <laughs> period. Now, you may lament that. You may wish it wasn't so. But for those of us who cannot be considered young by any stretch of the imagination, Wishing all you want is not going to change the fact in the matter. That's one of the things about the gospel of Christ and the New Testament teaching. It helps you face things for what they are, whether it's in your own life or the life of others. And some people just have a hard time with that. You remember back when we studied about the Bible and mental health, that one of the things I tried to lean heavily on in that is that some of the problems people have in emotional things, and uh, even in those psychological matters is that they can never accept reality. They're always trying to make things bend to suit themselves. Well, nobody's going to be happy around somebody like that, especially the person who tries to do it because he can't do it. So he's going to live in a continuous state of frustration. Um, the substance of what Mark writes about and his style, and I've talked a little bit about that, uh, and the way he treated what he does write about. As I said, this bears back on what I said, it seems like he's observing things and writing them as they happen. It has to do with, uh, like it's a transcript from life, and he was going through it as he wrote it down. Uh, it's interesting, too, to notice that when, and, and notice, you have to take time to look at this, but he often speaks of the, of the awe and the absolute amazement of those who saw and heard Jesus. Sometimes we'll do that where you say, well, what would that have been like to have been there and, and seen that? Well, there were those that did. Many that did. Uh, Mark 1.22, Mark 1.27, and on through the book, you can just come up with more and more. Our people are absolutely uh, flabbergasted, if you like a word like that, amazed at the works and sayings of Jesus. You know, I said he, he, he uses the term son of man more than anybody else. And what's interesting is that he writes as much about the emotions of Jesus as a man. Uh, man has emotions. Uh, he, chapter 7, verse 34, he has he records the fact that Jesus de sighed, sighed deeply in his spirit. Uh, chapter 6 and verse 34, he was moved with compassion. And uh, chapter 8 and verse 8, he, this is Jesus, marveled at the people's unbelief. Um, chapter 8 and verse 33, we see him moved with righteous indignation, righteous anger. In chapter 10, verse 31, you see that he loved, and that Mark's account, he loved the rich young ruler. Now, that's an interesting point, and I'll camp on it just for a minute, because you'll remember that because he was very rich and the Lord told him to sell all he had, come and follow him, that he turned and went away sorrowful. Uh, 
no record of him ever repenting and coming back. We have him just going away. But notice Jesus loved him, Mark said. But his love did not eclipse the responsibility of that man to do what was necessary the Lord told him to do to save him. That ought to tell us something about divine love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But because he loved the world and did for man what man could do for himself to make salvation from sins possible, hope of heaven and reality, he's not going to make us turn away from evil when we don't want to. Uh, chapter, I believe it's chapter 6, verse 31, um, he has Jesus growing tired and uh, being hungry. Chapter 11, verse 12, it talks about him feeling uh, hunger there. He felt the pangs of hunger. Um, so there are uh, numerous things like that that attest to the humanity of Jesus. And yet he's convincing people this is the Son of God who is to save the world and the only one that can. So that's one way, if you think about it, of Proving the love of God is to show that God became a man. Um, this story is told, and I don't think it's true, but it illustrates a fair point that's being made here, and that one reason why Mark would have emphasized the humanity of Jesus. It was said that there was a man and woman, husband and wife. She was a devout Christian, but he was an atheist. He didn't try to hinder her from doing what she wanted to do, but he ignored everything about what she did when it came to Christianity. And it was a cold and snowy day, and it had been cold for a long time, and snow had been on the ground, and there was very little for the animals to eat and the birds to eat. And like people do up north a lot of times, they, they help out by feeding the birds, and he was, while his wife was at uh, church, he was standing at the back door seeing the birds look for something to eat, so he decided that he would get some old bread crumbling up and throw it out to them. So he did, and he went out, and when he went out, he frightened the birds away. They all flew off. And he stood there perplexed and saying, if I could just become a bird and let them understand that I'm trying to help them, can you make the application? What did Jesus do? Well, as John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So, it shows you that God went so far as to put himself on the level of mankind by becoming a man. Uh, if you look at Mark's development of his book, he writes very chronologically. As I say, he, he doesn't write a complete biography. Of none, and we've already talked about that, and I won't go back over it. But he does write chronologically. He tells us of the personal reactions of Christ's hearers also. In chapter 1, verse 27, right there in the first chapter, he talks about how some were amazed. If you go to the second chapter, verses 6 and 7, he talks about how, those, how were the, there were those who were critical of Christ. And in chapter 4, verse 41, he says some feared him. And then, as we said earlier in chapter 7, verse 37, others were astonished at him. Some of them were just hostile to him, chapter 14, verse 1. And, of course, that caused him to be put to death. It's interesting, too, that Mark is careful to record details of persons. Uh, time, uh, numbers, and places. Yet the other writers, Matthew, Luke, and John, 
bypass these things. I do not know if it be true that much of what he got as far as eyewitness material came from Peter and inspiration guided him to infallibly record what God wanted in the book of Mark. But consider this regarding persons. Chapter 3 and verse 6, the Pharisees with the Herodians took counsel. And in chapter 15, 21, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was compelled to pair the cross. Then regarding time, in chapter 15, verse 25, it was the third hour and they crucified him. And in chapter 16, 2, speaking of Jesus, he arose very early on the first day of the week. As far as numbers are concerned, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he says they, they sat in ranks by hundreds and by fifties, chapter 6 and verse 40. And chapter 14, verse 30, before the cock would crow twice, Peter would deny Christ thrice. As far as places are concerned, chapter 2 and verse 13, he went forth again by the seaside. And in chapter 16, 5, they saw a young man sitting on his right side. Now, you can go probably online, Google all of this, and find a lot more detail concerning Mark and details about person's time, numbers, and places that he mentions. The Cambridge Bible by G.F. McClear does that in detail on pages 18 and 19. Well, here's some things that are unique to Mark. It's only Mark that mentions the concern of Jesus' family for his mental health. Chapter 3. And verse 21, the young man in the linen cloth at Jesus's arrest, chapter 14, 51 and 52. And as we said last week, people have speculated uh, that that could have been Mark. The parable of the seed growing secretly in chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. And he records the progressiveness of the healing of the blind man in chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. That's unique to Mark. It's not found in Matthew, Luke, and John. Mark, um, as William Barclay said, I quote, inserts little vivid details into the narrative, which are the hallmark of an eyewitness. And he often used Aramaic words, which would have been the common vernacular among the Jews speaking among themselves. Um, he uses Talitha Kumi, and we learn from chapter 541 that means damsel, I say unto thee, arise. He uses Ephatha. Be open, chapter 7, verse 34. And he's the one that uses, we joke about this sometimes, but he's the one that gave us Corbin, the Aramaic of given unto God, chapter 7, 11. And he employs the term Abba, Father, chapter 14, and verse 36. And then we all know this one. Eloi, Eloi, le masabachthani, which is my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Chapter 15, 34. The account of Jesus is what's usually called his passion, death and resurrection, occupy considerable place in Mark's record. Somebody, and I don't know who did this, but I read it somewhere, 
called Mark a passion account with a prologue, a passion account with a prologue. Then to comment again a little bit more on the literary style of Mark. His record is, according to F.W. Farrah, is marked by special vividness. This is what, again, I meant as if he's sitting there looking at the whole thing. It is full of charm, he writes, and color. It is brightened by touches inimitably graphic. The evangelist is a word painter. Then uh, Merrill Tenney, which many of us used his book, used for years in classes, introduction, New Testament, college classes. He says, the gospel of Mark is terse, clear, and pointed a style which would appeal to the Roman mind that was impatient of abstractions and literary inbreeding. It is the clean, vigorous, direct speech of the sturdy middle class. The style is very simple. It's been called the people's gospel. So a fellow by the name of Farmer wrote. Mark writes again for the ordinary man, for the practical person. Now, one of the things about Mark that comes to the forefront is the ending of the book of Mark. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, has the following footnote in the American Standard Version, 1901. It says this, the two oldest Greek manuscripts and some other authorities omit from verse 9 to the end. I don't know whether you know of the Thomas B. Warren Ballard debate. He debated a Baptist preacher. One of the efforts that the Baptist Ballard tried in getting away from Mark 16, 16 and the force of it, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be down, is try to say this very thing. And if you will get Brother Warren's book, you'll see how he anticipated that. And he does an excellent study um, showing that the very people and the versions that omit Mark 16, 9 through 20 also omit those passages of Scripture that premillennialists hold on to to prove their point or attempt to. And Ballard couldn't very well handle that because he couldn't have one omitted without the other omitted. I remember in talking to Brother Warren one time that he and we were talking about the different uh, versions of Alexandrius and Sinaiticus that are overseas, British Library and other places. Uh, and he said, but you haven't seen the, see, what's it called? The Washingtonian one. He says, uh, it of course is in Washington. And he says, it has Mark 16, 9 through 20 in it. And you get in then to a study uh, that is far beyond what we want to, to do here. But I want to say this about it. If you remove Mark 16, 9 through 20 and proved it to be spurious, what do you have in the rest of the New Testament regarding baptism? Even if Mark 16, 9, 9 through 20 wasn't there, you still got that baptism is a burial by the authority of Christ. It's into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's for the remission of sins. It's to be baptized into Christ and so on. So they don't like it because it's very plain that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They don't like it because it's one plus one equals two. So they do all they can to get rid of it. Also, we find this 
of uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20 regarding American Standard Version, the majority of New Testament scholars reject it, they say, including such conservatives as Tregales, Warfield, Zane, A.T. Robertson, um, H. D. Thiessen said that. Scholars who accept it include Bergon, Miller, Scribner, and Solomon. Now, I know a lot of those names mean nothing to you, but I would suggest the one that I would recommend you want to get a good, thorough defense of it is Bergon. Bergon fought these guys. He's an Englishman in the 19th century and was a very scholarly man. There are a number then um, of arguments against it, but none of them can really stand up. There are arguments also for its acceptance. It's found in most uncils and all cursives, in most versions, and in all Greek and Syrian lectionaries. It was quoted by the Greek church historian Irenaeus. And many of those noted as the church fathers, those that lived the first three centuries after Christ. The Codex Vaticanus, while I found this to be very interesting, while leaving it out, leaves a space between Mark and Luke that is just the proper length for these disputed lines. Now, why do they do that? By the middle of the second century, the gospel ended as it does now. If I had any guessing to do, I would say people who opposed the need to obey Christ and be baptized for the remission of sins uh, oppose it in those days just like they do today. We would say the alternatives are really unacceptable. Listen to this. The different ending found in some few manuscripts, I think, is obviously spurious. Here's the way that the passage reads. And they reported briefly to Peter and his company all that had been commanded. And after these things, Jesus himself sent forth them from the east, even unto the west, a holy and incorruptible proclamation of eternal salvation. It stops right there. If verses 9 through 20 were rejected, the account ends with this, for they were afraid. Does that sound like an ending to a gospel account? Very unnatural ending. And many who regard the longer ending as not part of the original mark as I said earlier, yet regarded as a truthful passage. H.C. Thiessen is one of those. There are all kinds of theories as to why verses 9 through 20 are different from the rest of Mark. Um, that Mark being prevented at the time from closing his work himself wrote the conclusion under different circumstances. Now let me pause again and remind us, God wrote the Bible. And men can look at it and weigh it any way they want to, but God wrote the Bible. Or that it may have been added by some other inspired hand before the publication of the gospel. Well, if it was an inspired hand, why should I be worried about that? Others theorize, and I emphasize theorize, that perhaps the last leaf was lost and the common ending added in its place. Now, why would God let an inspired book have part of it lost? when he's promised that all of his word, though heaven and earth passed away, would not pass away. So I just leave that at that. You could spend forever and a day studying those last verses of Mark. And it is an interesting study, but nobody can come up and say, we absolutely know beyond a reasonable doubt that those verses are spurious. They can't do it. And, uh, if you ever get into it somebody, then let them try. Again, we say Mark is one of the synoptic works. 
Now, I'll remind you again that the term synoptic means to see alike, and that's what you have in the first three accounts because they tell a similar story. And over 90% of Mark's material, all but 24 verses, is found in Matthew and Luke. Farrer said this, F.W. Farrer, I quote, St. Mark has two miracles and one parable recorded by himself exclusively. And in every incident and in every parable, he diverges from St. Matthew repeatedly, both in phraseology and in details. Mark records 19 miracles and five parables. He has 19 Old Testament quotations. A fellow by the name of Victor of Antioch, a fifth century scholar, prepared the earliest known commentary on Mark. He observed that while Matthew and John were often written on, he had failed to find even one commentary on Mark's gospel. I think it's good to note, too, that if you're just going to sit down in one reading and read Mark, if you're a pretty good reader, can be read through in less than two hours. That ought to tell us something about the time we spend with the Bible and how much time we spend with other things. I'm going to end with a, uh, I guess you'd call it a simple summary of Mark. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 13, you have the arrival and testing of the servant, the Lord. In chapter 1, verse 14, through chapter 5, verse 43, you have the minister ministry of the servant. And in chapter 6, 1, through chapter 8, verse 26, you have opposition to the servant. So first, there's the arrival and testing of the servant, then the ministry of the servant, now opposition to the servant. Then in chapter 8, verse 27, through chapter 10, verse 52, you have the servant instructing the disciples. Chapter 11 and verse 1, through chapter 12, verse 44, you have the rejection of the servant. In chapter 13, verses 1 through 27, you have the predictions that the servant made. In chapter 14, 1 through chapter 15, verse 47, you have the suffering and death of the servant. And in chapter 16, verses 1 through 20, the resurrection and commission of the servant. So I think that's a good stopping point in that summary. And the Lord willing, we will continue on with Mark and look at an outline of his book, which will help us nail down some things. And for a brief book, we can outline it rather detailed. And then we will end with the last some lessons to remember as we made the same approach to the study of Matthew. So we'll let you go a little bit early. It's about 8, 12, and everybody can have a, a good night with no nightmares. So is there, are there any questions or comments, anything anybody would like to say? <laughs>